Our assurance of character comes from 2 Corinthians. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ who died for us, rose for us, reigns in power for us, and prays for us. And everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Our old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and at peace. Present their 
commentary, and nobody was commenting on this story. They all picked another story from the lectionary from the Old Testament. A beautiful wedding story came to mind, and actually, Larry Leva, I had told this story to him, and he said, you need to preach on that one. So, so with encouragement from Larry, I'd like to tell you about an amazing wedding experience that I had. We all know that weddings, a wedding is one of life's truly sacred moments. It can be. Where two people commit their lives to one another in a very public way. If they call in a minister like me, they are asking for God's blessing on their union. Last spring I faced a wedding challenge. And a very dear friend who's an elder in the Reformed Church asked if I would officiate at her niece's wedding. It would be held on her, my friend's, historic family farm. This was going to be a big event in her life, and I wanted to support her. But I hesitated for months, or weeks, maybe a month and a half, as she kept asking me, would I do this, would I do this? I hesitated because not one guest was going to be from New Jersey. And I always pray that when I work at a wedding or a funeral in our area, that it will help bring people into our church and get our name known more in, in our community. But the bride and the groom and all their family and friends were from Boston, and they were making like a pilgrimage to central New Jersey. <laughs> So I'm like, well, what's in it for me? <laughs> uh, second, the couple wasn't particularly Christian. They didn't really believe in Jesus in particular. They liked some of the things Jesus said. And many people these days have non-religious weddings. But I have a call from God in my life to witness to the power of Jesus Christ in my life and in our community. And the RCA wedding liturgy that I know well centers around the promises of Jesus which support the promises the couple makes. So saying yes meant doing something really new without Jesus per se as the guiding host and presiding over a ceremony for people that most likely I may never see again. I wanted to say no. I tried saying no. But my friend was relentless. She just identified me as the right person for this time and space. So I don't know if you remember, but a few weeks ago we had the reading about the unjust judge that the widow pastors into giving justice. And I felt just like that. And reluctantly I just said, okay. Just because my friend pursued me. But I feel really lucky because after six months passed, I was given a new framework for my faith that fit this scenario so well. It's this little book called Surprise the World, and I'm reading it with some people in classes. It's about five habits of highly mission people, and this new group in classes, everyone is invited, so if you sound interested, if you feel interested, I have some handouts about this. Um, they're, follow they're really fired up about following these habits themselves and then encouraging others to follow these habits. So they follow this acronym called BLESS. So each one of those first letters is part of the practices. So I will bless three people this week, at least one of whom is not a member of our church. I will eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a member of our church. I will listen, L. Um, I will spend at least one period of week listening to the Holy Spirit's voice. I will learn, second L. I will spend at least one period of week learning Christ from the Gospels. And S. I will journal through the week about all the ways I alerted others to the universal reign of God through Christ. So I'm working on this, I'm thinking about this wedding ceremony, and then I realized I can hit all of them for like six months if I just do this wedding with gusto. So it helped me reframe the wedding. I realized that 
I was thinking very transactionally about my own faith and that this book was giving me a new format. So I started researching all kinds of wedding ceremonies from atheist to Roman Catholic. And I pulled elements that honored what I was hearing in my sessions with the bride and groom about their deepest intentions. And I also found ways to honor the heart of my own Christian faith. In front of their guests, I asked them to declare their intent. Did they choose respect, kindness, and compassion toward one another? Did they choose to listen deeply to one another and to speak truthfully to one another? both today and always. That's a pretty big promise, and it's not one that I found so explicit in any of the religious ceremonies. When they replied, we do. With their permission, I followed with words from the Gospel of Matthew. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said, but when salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything. Mark and Emma, I spoke to them, you are the light of the world, and no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. They put it on a stand so it will give light to everyone in the house. So this was a holy moment, and Mark and Emma were remarkable people, as I learned, as I got to know them. She was a surgical nurse, and he a medical supply manager, and together they cared for hundreds of people and solved some of life's most terrible problems all through the pandemic, and with their community of healers. Despite the stress of their relationship, I pray it would never wear them down, but build them up. I pray that their union preserves and encourages <coughs> the saltiness of each of their lives. And their wedding was like a play. It was like an amazing drama. Behind us, there was a beautiful lake. It had a fountain. There was an island with crimson fall leaves. Hundreds of loved ones sat on uh, bales of hay with shawls thrown over them in their fancy clothes. We were really honoring the earth, and that earth there, we honored their ancestors who had made that place a place of special family tradition. And Mark and Emma and their wedding party, of course, were dazzlingly beautiful in their best attire. And for that community at that time, this couple was salt and light and promise for a better world. And it took your breath away. Afterwards, the wedding party ran off for their photos, and the cocktail hour began, and I thought I'd get a hasty retreat home. But instead, as I walked toward my car, I was bombarded with questions and stories. Guest after guest came up to me and told me stories about their lives. These were strangers. They were telling me about pillars of their faith. They were so happy I read from the Bible. They had a longing for more God in their lives, and they were so thrilled that, that somehow, through all of this, God's presence was felt deeply by all of them, but not by the formulas that I had learned. So this made me approach this passage differently. How are we to use the words of the Holy Bible to bring God's light and salt to our world? And I think in this text, Jesus gives us some direction. First, Luke makes it really clear. The Sadducees are coming here to trick Jesus. They're not trying to legitimately grapple the scripture. They're trying to prove a point. They are trying to get Jesus to disavow one of his foundational beliefs and one of our foundational beliefs that God raises us to new life after we die. This is the center of his ministry. This is the center of his life. And the Sadducees are basing their argument on the letter of the law that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 25. If you look at that passage, it's about a time when brothers who live together 
And one of them dies without a son to carry on his name. And so this is solving a problem for the lineage of the family. So what does this mean for us, that this rule is here for us, that we read it on Sunday? The text says the rule is here to perpetuate the name of the deceased brother. However, if you read the whole Bible, the Bible itself seems to disagree that this is the point of this rule. The two main places in the Bible that I think of most where this rule comes into play, both times it is not for the name of the deceased brother, it is for the women who were made vulnerable in that death. So we see this in the gigantic book of Ruth, where Boaz is a wealthy farmer and he's a relative of Ruth's husband's father. Boaz is not a brother to Ruth's dead husband. He's a more distant relative. And the obligation was up for interpretation. He didn't have to do anything. Especially because Ruth was a farmer. Ruth is the Moabite. It says over and over and over again, Moabites were enemies of Israel. And that's what makes this story so salty and full and rich. In Ruth's story, the law from Deuteronomy doesn't provide a negative example of what's going to happen to a woman after she loses seven husbands. It's used as a positive example so that Ruth and Boaz, when they finally get together, their love far exceeded all the requirements of the law. And it's beautiful. And I think that's a key to what Jesus says when he, what he means when he says that he has come to fulfill the law. Like it's the spirit of the law, as Ruth and Boaz fulfilled. And, and we know this is important because it's not just the book of Ruth, but the product of their union, the child of their union is Obed, and he's the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of King David, who is a descendant of, who is a predecessor of Jesus. The second story is in Genesis, and it's a very weird story. It's about Judah, who his father is dead, Jacob. Judah is the top of the 12 tribes, and he has a son who's wicked and who dies, and he promises his daughter-in-law that he's going to make a husband out of his other son, and then his son dies. And so she's caught in this mix, and Judah doesn't know what to do. So in the end, Tamar takes matters in her hand. She poses up a prostitute, and she tricks Judah into having sex with her. It's a very weird story, and there's sin all over the place. But the truth of the matter is that somehow Tamar is made holy through this process, Tamar and Judah's child, Perez, is one also of the ancestors of King David. Very strange, very strange. The law in the Bible says one thing, but then the stories in the Bible use that law to kind of subvert or change or extend its meaning. These are creative interpretations in the lives of Ruth and Tamar, and they literally give life to generations and to our faith. I believe that in today's text, Jesus is warning us that if we take biblical words too literally, and if we only focus on one verse at a time, without the broader context, without the context of our faith and what we know about God, we can lose the spirit of God's word. By focusing on individual verses that way, the Sadducees are in danger of using them to reinforce the power of their own convictions. And much worse, they may miss the opportunity to testify to the light and the saltiness in which God created each of us. As I, interpreting my calls so narrowly, and transactionally, I might have missed the opportunity to draw a couple and hundreds of their loved ones just a little bit closer 
to the divine source of love and life. The source they were longing for anyway. In today's text, Jesus reminds us to work always for that bigger God that we know, for the bigger picture that God has in mind, for the kingdom of God on earth in which all God's creatures are part of. And this text from Luke is vital for us today. We need to beware of people who, who hold on to biblical inerrancy in a way that doesn't allow God's voice to be heard and broadly God's spirit to flow up through words. Many ministers, as I mentioned, across the U.S. today may be avoiding this story. It is troublesome because it imagines a fictional woman and also a set of seven men, and in the hands of the Sadducees, the people are reduced to tools for the sake of perpetuating a kind of deadly patriarchal structure. Nobody is hearing about what light and salt is for those people. Jesus does not entertain it, right? Jesus says, no way. Jesus says, those who live in this age are, and given in marriage cannot die anymore. You can't kill them anymore because they are like angels. They are the children of God. They are children of the resurrection. Each of them is wonderfully and fearfully made. And Jesus supports his interpretation. He uses Moses again, but Moses in Exodus, not Moses in Deuteronomy. So he has Moses conflicting with Moses, which is really interesting. And he said that, um, that Moses talked about his experience, wrote about his experience appearing in the burning bush, the bush that burns yet never dies. This is the symbol <coughs> of our faith. This is the symbol of our God. The God of the living, not the God of the dead. Our God always lifts up. Our God always restores. Our God reenlivens. God's people as light and salt for this world. So when we interpret the Bible, we have to do so so carefully, and we have to ask others to do the same thing, to make sure that God's Holy Spirit is in our works. Inside our church, and even more so outside our church, our call from God is to make the most of every opportunity I am learning to testify to the central truths of our faith. Even in our secular world, if we are persistent, we can be true to what we believe. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, each human being is a precious child of God, and you taught this to us through stories over and over again. Lord, our world desperately needs each person to add their own flavor of light and salt. You taught us how God's law is about preserving, restoring, and inspiring people alone and together as a sacred community. Lord, inspire us today to follow your way. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 247, I Love Your Church, O Lord, verses 1 through 3 after Susan's introduction, and please remain seated for this song.
We pray for Sandy Vitas and Imre Vitas, for their family and friends who are gathering today for a funeral service for Sandy's father, Jerry. We ask you, Almighty God, to pour your comfort upon them, to fill them with your grace and to encourage them, and to allow them to pour forth in their memories all the love and light that they received and during Jerry's time here on earth with them. Lord, we pray also for Donna Freeman, her husband Steve, as they and their family and Donna's mother, Nancy, mourns the loss of Donna's father, Norman. Lord, we ask you to accompany them in this time of grief as they prepare to celebrate Norman's life. We ask you to be with them and to guide them so that they will create an even more strong community of love and life in the memory of all the love poured out for them in Mormon's life. Lord God, we give you thanks today for these two beautiful souls, for the families that have supported them until their death. We thank you for the example of Jesus who taught us how to never abandon our even as they face death. Lord, we praise you and give you thanksgiving for this beautiful respite from the cold approach of winter. We thank you for an extra hour today, for extra rest. We give you thanksgiving for an amazing craft fair yesterday. We thank you for each person who poured their heart and soul into that craft fair, but also we thank you for all the support and encouragement they gave to the artists who were here, who exhibited, who sold their goods. Lord, art is an expression of your love and creativity. And this event shows so much of that in the food, in the fellowship, in the care. Lord, you heard the thanksgiving on the lips of all the artisans. We give you thanks and praise today for helping us to host this amazing event. Friends, let us join all these prayers and any special intentions that you have in your hearts as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
things about the craft fair, and it was a very successful uh, event. Uh, the time of fellowship was a wonderful thing for our congregation, for people throughout the community, and we hope to do this again next year. Uh, there's extra food. Uh, Barbara Molini made some beautiful sandwiches, assorted sandwiches that are excellent. And take the time to go down to the library and make a donation if you would like. But we, we have quite a few sandwiches left over, so please take advantage of that and take them home. Thank you. Thank you. Now receive this blessing from God Almighty. Each of you is fearfully and wonderfully made. Let that sink into your life and your soul. May you continue to be a blessing to this church and this community and especially today when you are needed as salt and light for many. We thank God, we praise God, and we bless His holy name.